Mr. Hackney had had a series of romantic relationships with different women who were parishioners in the church. After Don's death, Nick carried on relationships with at least two other women of the church. This isn't just one woman who scorned. This is many women who were manipulated and ultimately hurt by Nick Hackney in the same manner. On the early morning of December 26, 1997, Tim and Amy Pitts were awoken by someone banging on their front door. Jeff Richardson arrived at his co-worker Tim Hachney's home and saw it was on fire, so he wanted to alert the neighbors to call 911. Amy called 911 while Tim and Jeff ran over to see if Tim and his wife Dawn were trapped inside of their home. Jeff was able to kick the door down, but the fire had spread to the upstairs and there was thick black smoke pouring out of the home, making it impossible for him to get inside. When the fire department arrived, they believed the couple had either made it out of the fire safely or they were not home because of the holiday season. They smelled burning flesh, but at that point it was assumed it was Dawn and Nick's dog. It took over an hour for the fire to calm down enough for the firefighters to enter the home. They found the fire originated from the upstairs bedroom and that the bed had sunken into the floor. On the bed, they found a human body as well as paper crumpled up on the floor and a space heater that had been plugged in. At around 10 a.m., Nick Hatchney arrived at home with his dog and was pulled aside by Jane Jeremy, who was the chief deputy coroner. Jane spoke with Nick about what happened to his home and that there was a body inside, in which he identified as Dawn. Dawn's identity would later be confirmed by dental records, as her body was severely burned. Nick was very upset and explained to police that Dawn wasn't feeling well on Christmas the day before and took a Benadryl to go to sleep. Dawn also allegedly woke up at around 2 a.m. to take another Benadryl to help her head cold. Nick said Dawn was worried she was having an adverse reaction to be medicine because she was feeling worse after she took it, but went back to sleep it off. This made sense to the coroner because Dawn's body was lying flat on the bed as if she slept through the fire, so it was concluded that Dawn's adverse effect to the Benadryl caused her to sleep through the fire and that the medication had a very strong effect on her. Nick was devastated about the apparent accidental death of his wife, but he would have problematic behaviors over the course of the next few years. Dawn was born December 5, 1969 in Seattle, Washington to her parents Donald and Diana, and she was their only daughter and had three brothers. Dawn's childhood was often troubling. Her parents struggled with mental illness and often fought. Diana met another man in 1980 when Dawn was 11 and she left her family to move in with him. Diana ended up having another baby, but returned to Donald and her older children with her baby because her new relationship was not working out. Dawn turned all of her frustrations into doing well in school. She worked really hard to get good grades and even participated to the Scripps National Spelling Bee, which allowed her to visit the White House and meet former President Ronald Reagan. Dawn graduated as valedictorian from Bremberton Christian School in 1988 and enrolled at Northwest College of the Assemblies of God. While attending college, Dawn met Nick and hit it off right away. Dawn's friends at school were worried for her because she called Nick the one only after a few dates and they wanted her friend to have a supportive and loving partner. She knew everything about me. I knew everything about Dawn, all the problems. And when we started dating, we would talk about the boys and we could read each other. I remember her calling me and telling me that she met a guy and she really liked him. She thinks he might be the one. And I said, Dawn, how many dates have you had? How do you know he's the one? And she told me, no, you know, I think he's the one. They felt that Nick was pushy and full of himself and not a good match for Dawn because he was not a go-getter like her. Nick was also from a troubled family. Nick's father, Dan, worked constantly as a mechanic, and when he was home, he did not spend time with his family or help around the home. His wife, Sandra, ran a daycare from the home and also took in foster kids, which caused Nick to feel like she also was not there for him when he was a child. Through his loneliness, Nick turned to the Bible, and he took a strong interest into Christianity. When Dawn and Nick began dating, everyone noticed that Dawn seemed to not act herself. The once lively and outgoing woman began appearing to be shyer and would often allow Nick to make decisions for her. The couple continued to date and eventually got engaged when Nick proposed in 1990 on Alki Beach. Dawn and Nick were married on April 20, 1991 and moved back to Bremberton. 
Don took on a job as a loan officer, and Nick began working as a youth pastor at Christ Community Church on Bainbridge Island, which is a small island community located across the bay from Seattle. Don's friends and churchgoers said that Nick made all of the decisions, even if they went against Don's wishes and made her uncomfortable. Nick and Don both subscribe to Christian fundamentalism, a community in which the wife is expected to submit to her husband's authority, and that was God's plan. And at Christ Community Church, the message was clear that this behavior was acceptable and expected. Pastor Robert Biley was very extreme with his teachings, with his fellow pastors Nick and a man named P.B. Smith screaming and praying that demons exit the afflicted church members. Dawn found herself in what many would consider a cult, and Nick was one of the main perpetrators of dangerous behaviors. The church would conduct exorcisms, insist families have as many children as God allows, and those children should be homeschooled. The teachings also included modesty for women and uncomfortable questioning about sex. Nick really looked up to Robert and wanted to train directly under him. Nick was previously working closely with PB, who was much more laid back, but Nick did not feel he was learning enough and he did not like that PB was soft. By 1997, Dawn and Nick were having problems at home because the couple moved around often, living in the homes they would work on and flip to sell. Dawn wanted to start a family and settle down into a proper home, so Nick found a fixer-upper in East Bremberton for the couple to move into and fix up and renovate. The purchase of the home and renovations, as well as their side business of flipping houses, caused the couple to go into debt. While Dawn and Nick's relationship looked great from the outside, and that Dawn was this supportive wife that was willing to do anything Nick desired. The problems ran deeper than anyone could imagine. Dawn even asked a friend in an oddly joking manner if she could come and live with her because Dawn did not want to live with her parents if her and Nick were to split up. Nick continued to put himself into debt by lending out money to church members frequently, and he began working on his dream project, which was opening a Christian youth camp. This turned out to be an extremely expensive undertaking, but his vision was solidified when a member of his congregation named Sandy Glass claimed to have a vision from God that Nick would have the youth camp. He wanted on a property that Nick was interested in. Sandy was a young woman in her 20s whose first boyfriend had passed away from an unspecified disease. Her father had been killed in a construction accident and her brother struggled with addiction. Sandy was married to a man named Jimmy and the couple were having some marital issues. So they began seeking marriage counseling from Nick. Nick had been the church's marriage counselor for a few years by this time and many members complained to Pastor Robert because Nick would often ask the couple's intimate questions and treat the other issues as not important. Jimmy's parents also attended the church and thought that Nick and Sandy's relationship was inappropriate. They would talk on the phone often, and at church the two seemed to spend too much time together. Pastor Robert's wife Pamela also noticed Nick's behavior and spoke with him privately one day. She said his behavior was inappropriate and he needs to focus on his own marriage. Because of the complaints, Pastor Robert pulled Sandy aside and told her the relationship with Nick was inappropriate. Sandy was very angry about this because she felt that God wanted her and Nick to be together. Sandy wrote a letter to Pastor Robert that said, The judgment I feel from you makes it hard for me to believe that you accept my gifts at all, or that you have any confidence in my ability to hear God and use this to help anyone. Sandy and Nick's inappropriate relationship was causing hurt to everyone around them, Dawn was hurt, and so was Jimmy and his children he shared with Sandy. One of their children told Jimmy that Nick told them that after you die, he will be our new dad. Dawn began confiding in her friends at church that things were bad for her and that her finances were a mess. Dawn also told friends that she desperately wanted children and Nick would not hear of it. Towards the end of 1997, Nick began relations with several other women besides Sandy. He would be seen talking with the women in private and talking on the phone to them for long periods of time. Sandy's visions apparently also became more vivid during this time as well. She was urging Nick to open his youth camp and spend more time with her, because they were meant to be together. Dawn woke up on Christmas morning sick with a cold, and despite feeling terrible, she and Took visited with her family. Later on in the evening, they visited Pastor PB's home and spent time with his family. Nick made plans with PB's daughter and her friends to go hunting the next morning. Nick met his friends just before dawn on the 26th at Hood Canal Bridge in Jefferson County to go hunting. They were out in the woods for a few hours, but no one made a single shot that morning. They left the woods and went to a local diner for breakfast at around 9 a.m., and while everyone was eating, Nick suddenly jumped up from the table and seemed worried because he said that Dawn and I have not opened our Christmas presents. 
Nick then left the diner at around 9.30 a.m. and arrived home at 10 to learn his wife had died in a fire. Police told Nick the fire started because of a faulty space heater, and the fire grew quickly due to all of the newspapers and wrapping paper in the room. There were also many propane containers on the floor near the bed. Despite Nick telling his friends not even an hour before that him and Dawn did not open their Christmas presents, he told police the couple opened their presents the night before and because Dawn wasn't feeling well, she went to bed without cleaning up the wrapping paper and that he received the propane tanks as a Christmas present. The couple was doing many renovations to their home still and were using space heaters throughout the winter. Space heater-related fires and deaths are very common, especially years ago when they did not have as many safety features as they do now, so police did not have any issues with Nick's story. Nick was also a local pastor, so the police had no reason to believe that his wife's death was anything but an accident. Nick's congregation began to worry about him and wanted to support their pastor in what they believed to be a truly hard time for him. Pastor Robert suggested that they even try to raise Dawn from the dead with the power of prayer. Nick did not want to do this because he said that he did not want her to be in pain or disfigured. Pastor Robert was surprised that Nick refused his offer because Nick was on board for everything Robert wanted to do in the church, which included attempting exorcisms previously. Mary Glass, who was Sandra's mother-in-law, was suspicious of Nick right away. She believes that Dawn's death was not an accident and she wanted her husband to talk to the police. However, this did not happen because just days later, Dawn's death was ruled accidental and Bremberton police handed the investigation to Nick's insurance company to process Dawn's life insurance policy. Noon and their family or friends thought it was odd that Nick was working on the life insurance so soon after Dawn's death. The couple did have a lot of debt and he was working on opening his youth camp, so he did need the money. Nick's form of grieving seemed odd to some of the churchgoers, but no one said anything to him because everyone does grieve differently. Nick was able to stay completely calm during his wife's funeral and gave a 45-minute eulogy. Friends who helped clean his home found photographs of Dawn shoved in the back of a closet like he wanted to get rid of them, and Nick became callous and rude to not only some of the churchgoers, but neighbors and friends as well. Nick not only carried on multiple relationships with women from the church, but he also convinced Diane, Dawn's mother, that he was suffering with becoming a widow, and the two had sexual relations. Nick's behavior became too much even for Pastor Robert, and Nick was asked to leave Christ Community Church. This caused Nick to spiral, and his life would then take a sharp turn. On the morning Dawn died, Nick called Sandy and said, I did it, but Sandy's phone was interrupted by another call. When Sandy returned to her call with Nick, she wanted to know what he was talking about, and Nick continued to repeat, It's done. Sandy did not ask Nick about this call again for a few weeks, and when she did, Nick admitted to giving Dawn a large overdose of Benadryl and smothered her by covering her face with a plastic bag. Almost four years later, on April 10, 2001, Sandy Glass and her lawyer had a meeting with the county district attorney. Sandy was offered immunity in exchange for her testimony against Nick for the murder of Dawn. So, the case was reopened, and Nick was arrested on September 12, 2001 in the parking lot of a Kinkos. Nick insisted he had nothing to do with Dawn's death and that the church was trying to sabotage him. Nick insisted that the church members were capable of a lot of damage, but despite this, Nick was charged with first-degree murder, and his bail was set at $750,000. The story Sandy told investigators was so bizarre, but it was also very frustrating that it took almost four years for Nick to be arrested, or even be considered a suspect. Sandy's reasoning for complying with investigators is deeply frustrating as well. She was angry Nick was seeing other women in the church, and she felt she was being used. She realized that God did not want this relationship to happen, so that meant God did not want Dawn to be murdered. According to Sandy's testimony, Nick said he gave Dawn a large dosage of Benadryl to immobilize her, but she was still conscious and saw her husband suffocating her through a plastic bag. Once she was dead, Nick scattered newspapers and wrapping paper all around the room and under her body. He set the heater close to the bed so it would catch on fire because the propane tanks were close by. Dawn's autopsy stated that there was no soot or carbon monoxide in her lungs, and no carbon monoxide in her blood as well. The pathologist working on Dawn's autopsy believed that she died from an accidental fire and that she was a pastor's wife, so they did not take appropriate measures to let investigators know that carbon monoxide always attaches itself to red blood cells, and if Dawn was breathing, there would be soot in her lungs. Benadryl would not have caused her to stop breathing. In crime scene photos, you can see newspapers under Dawn's body as well, which should have caused alarm. When members of the church were questioned, they spoke of Nick's odd behaviors and inappropriate relationships. 
They were also very upset because Nick did not purchase a headstone for Dawn's grave after he received the life insurance policy. Only one person was suspicious at the time of the murder, and this was the fire marshal. As I entered the room, I noticed the wiring on the bed from the electric blanket, and we checked to see if it was plugged in and if it had been working, and we had to rule out the electric blanket being a cause of the fire. Then we found the space heater, and we had to make sure that was operational and plugged in also, which it was. And then I looked around and saw there was papers just all crumpled up in front of the space heater. He spoke with police on the day of the accident, but it was not his decision on whether or not Dawn's death was an accident. On September 17, 2001, Nick went before a judge to plead not guilty. Nick continued with the claim that his church placed a curse on him and that Pastor Robert had a terrible reach of diabolical influence that was much darker that the police could not possibly understand. Nick's trial started on November 4th, and by this point the charges were changed because Prosecutor Roosthouse did not believe the judge would go for the death penalty, which would be considered with the initial charge of first-degree murder. The charges were changed to aggravated first-degree murder, where Nick would serve life in prison without the possibility of parole. This charge was able to be changed later on because of the arson Nick committed. Testimonies were given from women Nick had previously held relationships with, as well as many other church members who had counseling with Nick to speak to the jury on Nick's behavior. Doctors and forensic experts also testified and stated that Dawn's body told the story about what happened that day, but it was looked over because of Nick's position as a pastor. The lack of soot and carbon monoxide is not normal for someone who was alive during a fire. On the fifth anniversary of Dawn's death, December 26, 2002, the jury deliberated for less than a day and found Nick guilty of aggravated first-degree murder. At the sentencing that took place on February 7, 2003, Nick gave a statement and told the courtroom, which included Dawn's friends and family, that he did not murder Dawn, and there are things that he regrets and wishes he could take back. He is sorry that they lost their daughter and that she deserved better than him. Nick was sentenced to life in prison. In 2007, Nick went to the state Supreme Court on an appeal that changed his life sentence to 26 years in prison. Because Dawn was already dead from Nick suffocating her, the original sentence of aggravated first-degree murder did not apply. Because Dawn died by being suffocated by her husband instead of being burned alive, Nick did not deserve life in prison. Nick should be getting out of prison in 2027, and he has received a lot of flack from the public in the last few years because of his appearance on TED Talk and his work on prison reform. I do think those are both important topics to be spoken on, but I do not think Nick should be the one we listen to. He has never had any remorse or taken responsibility for murdering Dawn. Dawn Hachney was a kind woman. She was smart and a go-getter. She wanted to provide the best life she could for her husband, and he still cheated blatantly in front of her face and murdered her in cold blood so he could be with whoever he wanted and use her life insurance policy to get out of his money problems. Thank you all so much for watching this video. Feel free to leave me a comment below with any cases you would like me to cover, and subscribe to be alerted when I post a new case. I hope you found this video helpful and informative, and I hope you all have a great day and stay safe out there.